and welcome to the Royal Festival Hall. In this film, we're going to explore Mozart's Clarinet Concerto Movement 3. My name is Rachel Leach, and we have a fantastic recording of the piece from clarinetist Benjamin Mellifont, the London Philharmonic Orchestra, and their conductor, Tim Murray. Mozart is now considered to be one of the greatest composers who ever lived and the central figure of the classical period. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart was born in Salzburg in 1756. His father, Leopold, a composer and teacher, recognized his son's gifts early on. And the young Mozart wrote his first pieces at the age of just five, his first symphony at eight, and his first opera at the age of 11. At 17, he secured a job as music master in Salzburg and was churning out pieces on a daily basis basis. By 25, he was at the centre of the classical music world, living and working in Vienna. Sadly, he died very young, aged just 35, leaving behind a wife, two children and a mountain of debts. It is said that sadly, they couldn't afford a proper funeral for him. Mozart had always been interested in the musical form of a concerto. A concerto is a piece for soloist and orchestra. He'd written some amazing violin concertos as a young man. Throughout his adult life, he wrote piano concertos, and he'd even written works for French horn, flute, and oboe. He wrote his clarinet concerto during the last months of his life in 1791, and many say it is one of his greatest works. It was written for his great friend Anton Stedler, a clarinet superstar, and was probably written for an earlier form of clarinet, maybe a basset horn or a basset clarinet. Like most concertos from this period, it has three movements, fast, slow, and fast again. We're going to look at the third movement, which is in rondo form. Rondo means round, so if you imagine a circle, as you travel around a circle, you keep returning to where you started. And so in a musical rondo, you keep returning to the idea that you hear at the beginning. I'm going to call that idea theme A. Here it is, bars one to eight. So we're in 6-8, a compound time which breaks down to two dotted crotchets. Each crotchet breaks into three quavers, and that gives the music a bouncy, swingy feel. We have the bright key of A major, and the tempo is allegro or fast. Mozart uses a smaller than typical orchestra here. He has two flutes, two bassoons and two horns, but no trumpets, oboes or timpani. And when the clarinet has the main musical material, he strips the orchestra back to just the strings, so we often have a chamber-like feel to the music. Let's listen to that opening melody again. It breaks down into two four-bar phrases. The first four bars present a question and sound like this. That phrase is like a question. It begins in the home key of A major and ends in the dominant of E. That means it's got an unfinished feel about it and it needs an answer. So here's that answer, bars five to eight. This second phrase starts and ends on the tonic of A major. And did you notice there were two types of articulation to the melody? We had some short, spiky quavers and some slurred semiquavers. There's also a tiny bit of chromatic movement. The accidentals show us where. The accompaniment during the opening theme is from just the string section. They have rhythmic patterns based on detached notes. The full orchestra enter next and repeat the theme. Their version is very similar to the clarinets, but with a little bit more decoration and some more dynamic contrasts, louds and softs. So look carefully and you'll see piano, quiet, crescendo, getting louder, forte, loud and piano again. And all of this in just two bars. At bar 17, the clarinet enters with the first of several virtuosic passages. And Mozart uses a technique that he's going to use several times throughout the piece, an anacrusis. Anacrusis is the term we use for when a line starts on the upbeat rather than the strong beat of the bar. So let's listen to that clarinet entry.
This virtuosic showing off section takes us to the dominant key of E so that we can return back to the tonic again and the ideas from the beginning at bar 24. After this, we have a short linking passage which runs from bar 31 and takes us to the first episode of our rondo. So remember, rondo form features an idea that keeps returning. We're going to call that section A. And in between, we have contrasting ideas that we're going to call B, C and D, etc. This link features a short cadential figure at bar 40. A cadential figure is just music that goes with a cadence. And cadence is the term that we use for the two chords placed at the end of a phrase, a section, or a piece. Here, it's a perfect cadence, chords five to one, dominant to tonic, so in A major, that's E to A. Listen out for the first violins at this point because their music is syncopated. So we have six quavers in each bar, and we should have them emphasized like this. One, two, three, four, five, six. But we just heard the violins emphasize the third quaver. One, two, three, four, five, six. And that is syncopation. At bar 51, the music continues to alternate between chords five and one as the section comes to an end. So let's listen to this bit and onwards into section B. We'll pick it up at bar 31. You just heard the first episode of the piece or section B and as usual when the clarinet had the main material it was accompanied just by the string section no woodwinds or horns the new theme was then repeated down an octave and it had a tonic pedal throughout so that means the tonic note of A was present the whole time so let's listen to the beginning of the B section again The strings introduce a new little idea at bar 73, and as this moves around their orchestra, the harmonies change. And then at bar 97, it sounds like we have a conversation across the orchestra. I think this sounds like the horns are announcing something. The winds and the strings are querying it. And then the clarinet comes in with the answer. Take a listen. This is one of the first examples of really clever harmony in the piece. The chord that you hear at bar 98 is a dominant seventh with a flattened ninth. You can see it really clearly if you look at the woodwind parts. That F natural is the flattened ninth. And then at bar 110, we have a Neapolitan sixth chord. This is a chord found on the flattened sixth degree of the scale. So in A major, that's an F natural. There's a sixth within the chord, F natural to D sharp. And this resolves outwards to E, the dominant, and then resolves back to the tonic. It's like a jazzy, perfect cadence. Here it is in isolation. All this is a really fancy way of returning us back to the home key and the material we heard at the very beginning. So here it is, played by the clarinet, but then something unexpected happens.
After hearing the clarinet return to the home theme, the orchestra crash in with the end of the A section, rather than going through all the different bits of the A section as they did before. It's as if Mozart is getting impatient and wants to push on. After this, the orchestra developed the end of section A with some sequential patterns. That means ideas are repeated on higher or lower pitches, and there's also a hemiola. I'll explain what that is after you've heard it. Maybe you spotted that the music seemed to change time there. It went from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It seemed to move into three beats in a bar. Well, that is a hemiola, and Mozart does this at bars 1, 3, 1 and 1, 3, 2. Here it is in isolation. You should hear two bars of three followed by three bars of two. He's also moving us into the relative minor key, F sharp minor, and he's doing this for the C section. So let's hear that now. As ever, it's started by the clarinet with another anacrusis. tune is a bit sadder and smoother than all of the others and that's probably because of the minor key. You just heard it twice, the second time it was down an octave in a lovely woody bit of the clarinet's range. After this there's another link which features some large leaps from the clarinet over the subdominant of D and we're heading back to the A section but instead of a full A section Mozart just develops ideas from the very beginning and it's like a small memory of section A which leads to a small memory of section B at bar 188. Let's listen on. We hear the B theme and then when it's repeated it's in the tonic minor key, A minor. All of that development of ideas has led us to this mysterious pause bar, after which there's another one. The harmony is slipping back to the dominant because we need to return to the dominant so that we can get back to the tonic and back to section A. So let's listen on. We're in the dominant key and you might just recognize some ideas from earlier. Mozart would have hated us to stop here, up on an unresolved dominant seventh chord, but we did that to hopefully make it obvious what's coming next. We're going to return back to the tonic and back to the A section, and we're going to hear it in full. What follows next is an exact repeat of the opening A section, and that runs us up to bar 300. 
bar 301 is the start of the coda. Coda just means ending. And in classical concertos, this is a chance for the composer, soloist and orchestra to really show off and finish with a flourish. Mozart begins his coda with some more virtuosic writing for the clarinet, including some bubbly arpeggios and some scales. He also brings back some ideas from earlier, including that syncopated cadential figure that we heard right at the beginning. And that's one of the ideas that brings the music to a close. There's one more giant leap from the clarinet at bar 346. And then the piece ends with an alternation between chords five and one and two tonic chords on the end. So with huge thanks to clarinetist Benjamin Mellifont, the London Philharmonic Orchestra and Tim Murray, here's the full movement. <laughs> 